if you just double check the audio on your device you're watching, don't worry, it works just fine. I purposefully introduced this video without any sound at all to give you a little insight on today's topic is how to train a deaf horse. What's up everybody and thank you for tuning in to yet another video. Today's topic is a very interesting topic in my opinion and I hope that you will find so. Among the many great questions that we receive through our online subscription platform, YouTube channel, social media and great questions that I'm dying to answer because they are really good topics that I cannot wait to get in depth. But this one in particular really caught my attention because I happen to have been involved with this type of horses extensively throughout my career. So this is a topic that I feel very comfortable talking about about and that I cannot wait to get into. The question comes from CD Western Horse. It says, Jonathan, I know you have a bunch of bald faces in your string. I have a deaf one that I'm about to start this winter. The general consensus seems to be to make no difference at all in training versus a hearing one. What's your take on that? And do you have any tips? Yes, I do. First of all, you are absolutely right. As far as I'm concerned, I make absolutely no difference in training a normal horse or training a deaf horse. Whether it is from how to use my hands, my legs, uh, my cues, my voice, I still cluck, I still say whoa, I still kiss, I do all of the same things because this is something that's imprinted into my, 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 the, the deep core of my body, into my fibers. This is how my whoa cue, it, it's part of, it's part of the cue and it's just, every time I try to not kiss or not cluck or not say whoa or whatever just because, oh, the horse is deaf so I, I guess I feel stupid doing it. Well, you shouldn't. You should just, just ride the horse, a deaf horse, the same, same way as you would ride a normal horse. With that said, that doesn't mean that the horses or deaf horses will actually respond the same to your cues, to your leg, to your hands, the same as a regular horse would. And so this is why that the foundation put on these horses is critical. I will show you a few scenarios where a deaf horse can be problematic either short term as they are training or long term as they are broke. So let's go over to the arena where TX is waiting for us. He is a three-year-old stallion, deaf, and he is by the great spooks get a whiz. And we're gonna we're gonna go over a few different scenarios and things that that I think are very important things to know when tackling the task of training a deaf horse. Let's get after it. So in the early stages of training your horse, you know, how you're going to use your hand and how you're going to use your legs and your seat is gonna have to be, you know, really similar to how you're used to doing it, but there's gonna be some mild differences. And I think that one of the primary difference is going to be when stopping your horse, okay? Because a lot of the time, the woe is the signal that tells the horse we're going to stop and the body just rides the stop. So if we are loping, you know, one, two, three, whoa, then ride the stop, okay? So this is gonna be different because there is gonna be no whoa. So the problem that we're gonna encounter with deaf horses and the problem that I often encounter, that signal to the stop that I that I really, really put a very big emphasis into developing from the very early stages on, okay? So uh, if you go back into the foundation program of my video training series, you will see that in almost every single video that I talk about stopping or I talk about riding a young horse and the important things, I talk about how important it is for them to just to crave that desire to use their hind end to break themselves down from a lope to a walk or from a walk to a stop. And, and I want them to that just by you relaxing your body. So my young horses, I really encourage them from very early on to feel when I relax my seat so that they can uh, do their downward transition just from me relaxing my body and not having to apply any pressure in the stirrups or use my hands to pull in their mouth. And that's, that's where the communication starts from, okay? So this is why that it's very important, especially in a deaf horse, to really encourage that from early on. And this is how I train my stops in the very early stages. If I'm 
you know, if I'm loping a horse or I'm trotting a horse and I want to stop them and they don't really have sliders yet and they don't really know what it all means, how do you, but I want to teach them how to do it without pulling on them. I really want to avoid having to pull on them to teach them to stop. I want them to learn it from feeling my seat change and, you know, and me sitting a little deeper in my pocket and realize, relaxing my body. And so for that, if I'm loping and they're a little bit hot and I feel them a little bit ahead of me, it may not be a good time to ask them to stop because they probably will not feel it. So it's really better to just relax yourself and, and just wait until they're sort of anticipating breaking down to a walk or stopping and then asking them at that time. So this way you have a higher chance of success and then you practice doing it right from the get-go. And it's really important that from the start you can lope your horses around or trot your horses, your young horses or walk and then just do that and they come right back to you, okay? So, um, so this is something that I, I do very often is transitioning from, from the trot to a walk or the walk to a trot or a lope to a walk. Okay, so when my horse is, I feel that he's paying attention to me, that he's connected with me, I just relax myself like that. And there you go, there goes the reaction. I didn't have to push in my stirrup and I didn't have to use my hands. And I think this is an element that as, as important as it is for, 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 for any horse in, to me in any discipline, uh, at any stage or whatever you want to do with your horse, I think that is crucial for deaf horses to really feel and respond good to that very early on because it's going to be a little bit harder to implement down the road. So another area where, where you know, where, where cueing a deaf horse is going to be slightly different than cueing a horse that can hear is, for example, is loping off. So, or even trotting off or, or asking for a lead change or whatever. So the, the cue when you ask a horse to lope off comes from the outside leg. So there's a, the pressure with the outside leg that, that says to the horse, execute something. But the way that I like to train my horses is by applying my outside leg pressure, driving forward with my inside leg and controlling the shoulder until my, I feel my horse is properly in his diagonal and ready to lope off. At that time, I release my hands a little, lean forward slightly, and cluck them into the lope. But see, he can't hear me. So the only different thing that I had to do here that I may not would have had to do with a non-deaf horse is as I cluck, I applied a little extra pressure with my leg or with my spur just to tell him, okay, we were setting up, now I'm asking you to do something. That combined with me leaning forward and sort of giving him the indication that we're going to lope off with my body um, is, is what was telling him that we are going to lope off. But again, those are not things that I think about at all and other, <laughs> other than now when I'm explaining it because these are just how I lope off regardless. And, you know, take a lazy horse, for example. If a lazy horse doesn't respond to clucking, you know, sometimes they sort of you know, they, they, they play deaf, you know, they can hear you, but they act like they can't, you know. And so I think that those may be even, you know, harder to, to properly teach to make a lead departure versus a deaf horse, which maybe he cannot hear the clock that signals him to go, but he can feel every single ounce of pressure coming from your leg or your hands, I think, uh, to, a higher, to a higher degree than, uh, than, a, than a lazy horse would. So, so I think that it's, it's a kind of the same approach, and if you don't get a reaction, then you might need there to give him a little tap that the next time you're doing this motion with your body, he's gonna know that he needs to execute something, okay? See, this time I didn't even say, whoa, and I got very good reaction to my seat, okay? Just because he's pretty relaxed and we were you know, we've been working on this and, and sort of prepared for this, but in situations where he's a little bit more tense or more scared, uh, uh, you know, or, or just because, let's say, if you're working lead changes and you have to be using your legs a little bit harder or a little bit more, sometimes they get a little bit tighter in their body, and this is when they may not feel your, the cue coming from your seat quite as much. 
Okay, so now in the previously departure, I, he didn't quite react to that little extra pressure that I did, so I gave him a little tap. That was mostly for the benefit of showing you the result on, or, or what I would do in this instance, but I prefer to sort of wait a little longer before I correct them or before I use the, or before I kick them, sorry. See, this time I chose to wait because the time before I kicked him, if I kick him every time, he's going to become a little bit scared. If it wasn't perfect, no problem in doing it again. I didn't like this transition, if you notice, so we're going to be doing this again because when I relaxed myself, he sort of tensed up instead of just breaking down to a walk properly. A little bit better. Good. Uh. Well, that was fun. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. TX is really a nice horse to have in the barn and I'm very excited to have him. He's been very consistent and he's the one type of horse where in 95% of the case, I would say uh, you wouldn't know the difference between a deaf horse or not. So, and I think that is going to be mostly the case for, for, for most of the deaf horses that you will encounter uh, and that I have encountered. And the only one that I would be that I would say can be problematic and that would be aware of and, 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 and address maybe a little differently than other horses are the ones that tend to live a little bit more inside their bubble. These tend to spook at things more often and that can be a problem in the early stages. But again, if you, if you don't overpressure them and you take the time to give them confidence, uh, it goes away, it sort of fades away, their fear, their tightness, their spookiness sort of fades away over time and then they will turn into very normal horses. And in some cases, to be honest, running in the finals, whether you're at the rodeo or whether you're at a reigning show or a cutting or whatever, running in a big event packed with a crowd that are going to be screaming in music or whatever, I sort of like find comfort in knowing that my horse can't hear all that so there he's you know so for him it may just be another ride the same as any other ride that I've had at that event so I do find comfort in sometimes in knowing my horse can't hear the crowd in, in uh, during a big you know during a big event. So that's it for today so if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel please consider subscribing as many more videos are in the works and will be released shortly. I am trying my best to release at least one video a week. Please keep sending me questions as it's very inspiring as to what you guys, as to, as to indicating to me what it is you guys would like to hear about. And again, I do have a fairly long list of questions that I've received over the past weeks that I really want to address. Most of those questions are addressed in one way or another in my online video series the comfort zone so if you haven't yet checked it out do so because the flow of information that goes from the cold starting through building a foundation developing training tools and then just solidifying your maneuvers no matter what discipline no matter what western discipline you're focusing on the foundation program that I teach my horses is very universal and is very effective for, for, uh, for developing uh, ultimate body control, therefore giving you the tools that you need to do what you want with your horse. And this is why I believe that the reigning foundation is such a great foundation for any Western discipline because the body control of the shoulder and the softening of the neck, hip control, and rib cage control and the, the movement of the feet is just uh, as precise and as nimble and as easy as can be. So I'm just rambling on here. I am not knowing really exactly where I'm going. The French Canadian is getting very strong. It may be because I am tired. So I think that it's time for me to end this video before I say anything else that sounds really, really, really crazy. So with that said, Thank you for watching, consider subscribing, give this video a like if you liked it, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers!